Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome into Tom Cameron's Patriots Talk podcast. Big week for the Patriots off the field. On the field, not as much, but we figured who better to bring in to talk about it than Devin McCourty. Nobody is more emblematic of what the Patriots have been since he got here in 2010 than Devin. We're going to get his insights all the way through from Bill Belichick to Gerard Mayo to what the Patriots should do with the quarterback position. So strap in. Here comes Dev. All right, ladies and gentlemen, here he is, the legendary Devin McCourty. You know he made his name on quick slants, but he also played football for the New England Patriots. He's going to be a Patriots Hall of Famer. He's done an unbelievable job in his first year with NBC, too. Dev, thanks for coming on. No problem, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah. uh, What a strange week it is to try and process what's going on in Foxborough. Just your vantage point, from your vantage point, what do you see the Patriots grappling with here, with the decision? Yeah, I mean, I think the hardest thing is when you look at this team, you know, a month ago it was like, this is so bad. You know, we're just losing game after game. Um, and But you you look up now over the last month of the season, it's a different feeling. There's this team that, you know, went on the road and beat Pittsburgh. It's a team that fought and went back and forth with Kansas City, a team that, is probably is gonna that won the AFC West, and then they go to Denver, a team that was playing like I get it. When you look at overall records for mm-hmm. Denver, it's not great. But when they played Denver, Denver was this team that was finding ways to win. They were getting it rolling. They had a chance to now be in the playoffs. They go and just really handle Denver all game, and then they played his last weekend against Buffalo, and it's a game really you can say they outplayed Buffalo in a lot of different ways. The turnovers early crushed them, but the kind of second half of that game, even on the offensive side of the ball, they moved the ball. They mm-hmm. were able to make big plays. Um, the defense is playing absolutely lights out, unbelievable. So I, I think the decision has become really hard. I think the decision of Bill not being in New England has been like this hot topic um, all year long. Uh, but I think when you you look and I see a lot of times owners like now being in the sports media and following like everybody, everybody that got let go during the season this year, it was all on the idea of we're not progressing and getting better the way I felt we should as a team. And I think if you put that kind of mentality on the Patriots, are they getting better? Are they improving as mm-hmm. a team? And if you let your head coach go, Will the next head coach get this team to play better than the way they're playing right now? I think that's ultimately the decision that has to be made. Do you think there's better out there to get this team moving forward? Um, And for me right now, after watching this team this last month, I would find it really hard to believe that you can say, hey, if we move on, we know for sure that we're going to be better without Coach Belichick. I think strictly because – when you take over a team or you're taking over a team and now you have, you know, it's week 14 or whatever it is, and you only have two mm-hmm. wins. If you look across the league, a lot of teams go like it gets sure. ugly, right? You see more and more guys on IR. You see bad football, sloppy football. Guys are just showing up, not watching film, not doing anything. And you saw the complete opposite with this team. This team mm-hmm. has, you know, rallied and fought. And I don't know, you know, I haven't been asking those guys. I don't know what the rallying cry has been inside, but it's working and they're going out there and playing and it'd be interesting to see. It is. And here's the interesting thing though, in the course of time where it mattered, the Patriots went two and 10. And even in this stretch, they're still since they lost to Indianapolis, like, okay, they, they beat Denver. They got a gifted kickoff return fumble touchdown. They, you know, beat Pittsburgh, and that was with Mitch Trubisky. And I look at this, and if I am, if I'm in an ownership position, I've already made a decision, and and I'm looking for confirmation about this team. I don't know if this stretch of play changes my mind because I'd be like, what about the beginning of the year? What about the development of these players? And when I look at who they're playing for, who do you think they're playing for largely? It's, it's like on if you were in that locker room at this juncture, would you be playing for yourself and your teammates mostly, 
or for the coaches. And maybe those coaches could be your position coach, your defensive coordinator, or your head coach. What would your mindset be? Because you were absolutely the the beacon in that locker room for so long. What would the message that you and Matt Slater would be sending on a week-to-week basis? I would be talking about playing for your teammates and for yourself. I just firmly believe that. I remember one time, um, Bill said that in my career about guys playing for him or playing for a head coach. And he was like, you don't play for me. Like You guys play for each other. Like you go out there, you train in the off season, you're out there on the, on the field together. Like the coaches and the staff, like, yeah, we're going to help. We're a part of this, but like you guys go out there and actually do the job. And I think you have to play for that. And I, and I do think, yes, you can bring up, you know, Trubisky was playing quarterback. You can mm-hmm. bring up, you know, Wilson ended up getting benched. So that's a different story. Like you can bring up all these, but like, as you look at the landscape of the, of the league, like would you fire Mike McDaniel? Because when you look at the dolphins, you can say the same kind of thing. Like, yeah, you beat Dallas, but you know, you got blown out by Baltimore. You lost to Buffalo, like the good teams you lost to. And I think as you watch, like, would you fire Nick Cerrone? Like you, you played all year, you limped through some wins and then now you look really bad. So I think, You have to always look to say, like, all right, do Mm -hmm. I think this person is the best fit for the job? Like, yeah, we get out of season. And I I think ultimately, though, you can't have a season where you finish in the top five for the draft next year and not have changes. Like, changes, no matter what happens, whether you keep your head coach or not, I don't think you just say, you know what, everything's fine. We're going to do this all again. No, you're like, you're going to have changes and you're going to have big changes because you didn't go to the playoffs last year. You haven't been you haven't been the standard of football or competing for your division the last few years. And then this year is just, you know, eliminated by week, you know, 14 or 15. Yep. You you have to make some kind of big change. I, I definitely think that I just don't know if the big change at head coach is it. Like I just don't know. Yeah. And that's when we talk about these games, and I'm getting into the details and explaining why. Um, the outcomes were a little false or misleading. It doesn't really get to the point of why the Patriots aren't competitive this year and why they weren't improving and why they weren't a 10 win team. Like I thought they actually could be, or Robert Kraft thought they might be. And that's because the players really just aren't good enough and they're not developing while they're on the team. We can look at Mac Jones and the direction he's gone in and say, Well, he hasn't developed the way a first-round pick should. You guys scored 48 touchdowns in 2021 on offense. 48. There's 25 right now on offense. So it isn't necessarily Bill and and guys playing hard for him and him cooking up a scheme. It's, It's the guys, especially on the offensive side, who are executing it. So, and that, and maybe the ultimatums that Robert put down are, are, are kind of, hanging over them as well look we need improvement if we don't get improvement you know we we gotta we gotta have improvement and then yet or what you know we're at the or what stage and and i think it is interesting because i think how how they see that particular relationship or situation between drafting mac with the 15th pick in the draft and the development i think however they view that will probably be the number one hit thing on the priority list of do we feel like we have the best coaches in the building going forward, depending on how we view what happened here? And I think that's really tough. Like, I didn't plan the offensive side, so I, I don't fully know. But I do know when you look out across the landscape of the NFL, Mac Jones isn't, like, here, and the rest of the guys we're watching play on Sunday all the way up here. Like, I just don't believe that. Like, again, watching all of these games, sitting down Sunday – we're watching some of these quarterbacks, and I'm like, that guy's not that good. This guy's mm-hmm. not that good. Like across the league, especially with some of these injuries, you're watching different guys, and depending on the weeks, like you're seeing, like you look at Minnesota, like Kevin O'Connell has been coaching up different quarterbacks ever yep. since Kirk Cousins went down, and they have some weeks where it's bad. Then they have some weeks where you're like, wow, like they put up 35 points, 40 points. You look at Cleveland with Stefanski and what they've done. I know Joe Flacco doesn't really count because his sure. experience and his level of play, but you look at getting Deshaun Watson back to being able to play one in football. You look at DTR stepping in there playing. You look at uh, P.J. Walker. Play. Like You look at all of these different guys, like these coaches 
have not gotten the opportunity to have their hands on and work with a quarterback for the length of time that Max gotten to work, you know, just starting in April. You know, mm-hmm. some of these teams are taking these quarterbacks like Josh Dobbs, who's been a backup for multiple teams. And then all of a sudden we're like, Josh Dobbs is really good. And some of that is scheme and, and putting a guy in the right place. So I, I do think, you know, I've said it before, like that whole situation with Mac, we can't just walk away or I can't just walk away and say, man, he's just a bad quarterback. Like, yes, do I do I think he's, you know, Joe Burrow and Josh Allen? No, I don't think that. I'm, I'm not saying that. But I, I also don't think he's one of the worst starting quarterbacks in the right. NFL that started this season. I, I don't believe that either. So um, I think that situation has to be figured out. And whatever, you know, the Crafts decide that they think happen or, or needs to happen, I think will probably ultimately be how they move forward. And then the question is, how do you make that situation right at quarterback right. moving forward with the decision you make? Yeah, I mean, because Mac in New England is most likely cooked. Yep. And it shouldn't be that way. Because what you believe, what I think the Crafts believe, um, what we saw in 2021 wasn't a mirage. It's a guy who needs people around him. And I think that it just the protection was so bad, it left him shell-shocked, and he really didn't have any bailouts, no yeah. slot receiver necessarily. And I- Go ahead. And I, and I also think it's hard too that I see like everybody's like, well, put Mac in San Francisco and he's Brock Purdy. Like, I, I think that's a little bit of a stretch too. I think it, it takes away what Brock Purdy has done and, and his ability to go in San Francisco and play at a high level. Like, I'm not saying Mac can't do that, but I think it's hard that people are just like, place him here and this will definitely happen. Like, no, you don't know that. We honestly don't fully know the capability of Mac Jones. Like we don't know if everything goes right. If this team is still a Super Bowl contender with him at quarterback, like no one knows that it's very similar to Jared Goff. Like Jared Goff is a good quarterback. He took the Rams to a Super Bowl. Ultimately they lost in that Super Bowl. Now he's in Detroit. Like Detroit's team is pretty good. We still don't know though, if Jared Goff will help that team get over the edge to be a Super Bowl contender, I think that's what's different about New England. If right now in New England had what Detroit had and you go to the playoffs, but you don't win a Super Bowl, everyone would still be like, well, we got to we got to do this because only thing that matters is actually winning the Super Bowl in New England. Right. And I think that's the thing that I don't want it to be missing shoot that I think like if everything went right with Mac, they would be Super Bowl contenders because Mac's the next Brady, which I think some people kind of walked away with after 2021. And I don't think that's a fair assessment either. Like we don't know his true ability or what right. the ceiling is. And I think it, it they could have helped get to that point by year three. And I think that didn't happen. And you talked about that as being maybe the primary driver in this next decision, because the Patriots are in a position where they're going to have a top five pick in the draft. They got $68 million of cap space, which is the third most in the league. And you're now looking at, the team having gone from Brady and kind of missing on that decision and saying, yeah, we don't think he's any good anymore. And he goes to Tampa and he is still pretty good. And then you have Cam and I don't blame him. I mean, Cam, Cam worked. I don't give a shit what anyone says. Cam worked. For a guy that got picked up in July. He ran for 12 touchdowns, Dev. He only threw for eight, but he ran for 12. It wasn't for Cam. He was screwed, right? Like you follow this guy who sits in the pocket he throws the ball all around the field and he and he doesn't throw interceptions too. Like let, let's put that like he does all the right things. And now you come in and your style of play is totally different. So everyone that has gotten used to watching New England doesn't want to see really what he brought. Right. But I think again, that 2020 team was Cam Newton and not a, a ton of talent around him. And I think that the made a difference bird. too. Demir Bird, Dev, had 47 catches. God bless I mean, him. I'm not saying he stinks. He's an NFL player, and he, he caught 47 balls, but that – And was... even if we ha- if you take this defense this year and put it on a 2020 team, it might even be different because our defense that year, we had a lot of guys – like, there was no Hightower. You had guy no Chung. He opted out. And then we ended up playing a lot of games where guys that, you know, were there on practice squad all year, and they had to earn a chance to go play. That's not ideal in the NFL. So mm-hmm. – it's been it's been rough, and I think the team probably is saying, "Hey, if we draft the quarterback in the top five, or we go out there and we get, let's say, a Russell Wilson um, throwing that out there, and we invest money in that position, how do we make sure whatever we decide to do at the quarterback position, 
we have the best development plan and offensive plan that's going to help us win games. And I think that that needs to be the focus of the whole offseason and whatever decision that they decide to make. And that being the case, do you look at Bill's recent record with Mac and and the offense in general, whether it be you know Jacoby Myers decisions or tight end decisions or offensive line decisions, say you know what, it's just it's not working. It's just yeah, I I, I do think they again I I said it before. I think one of the the hardest things that the the Patriots position is right now is. You look outside the league and you look at Houston and you look at Arizona and you look at the way those two teams are built. They're, Arizona didn't win a lot of games this year and Houston has been a, a shock to everyone. And you say like, wow, they put together really good teams. Like who's their general managers? And then you look and you go, oh, it's Nick Casario. It's Monty Austin for it. Wow. Like those guys were in New England. So I think – when you talk about those decisions of personnel and, and this guy in and that guy in and should we have kept him, I think it's hard because you look out there and you're like, we had two guys in our mm-hmm. building that we probably should have done more to keep so that they're not out there now building teams in a way that they're highly successful and we're not because now we're trying to figure out what happens next because we lost those guys kind of back to back. Like those guys left. And then Ziegler left, and I know, you know, it didn't work out for the Raiders, but that's that's three guys that went on to take general manager jobs in the NFL that I kind of stop and say, like, man, could you have made some kind of run at this person to make sure they stayed in your building to help you continue to build on what happens next? Um, and that's, you know, it's not a knock on, you know, Matt Groh and what he's doing. I just know right now what New England's doing – from a personnel standpoint with, with Grow and, and Bill is not is not living up to what nope. Houston's doing. And even when you look at the future for Arizona, I mean it looks a lot brighter. You look at Trey McBride, who was what uh, look at Paris Johnson, like you look at these decisions they made, you know, to trade back and now they'll have more draft. Like they've made some decisions where you yep. kind of look up and you're like, man, I can see those teams getting a lot better in the future. And you look at, and the other thing, the counter, I think the bill would have to that is, man, look at all this attrition I've had. I had to, I mean, Monty wanted to be a GM, yep. you know, and, and Nick wanted to be a GM. They're not going to, they're not going to make the same money here. And you want to be able to realize that kind of, I can't stand in their way. And they wanted to go in many cases, yeah. because yep. look, when you're working for Bill Belichick, it's still going to be Bill Belichick's decision. That's yep. why whatever you do to shuffle up, people say, we'll take G- Bill's GM duties away it's still going to be bill yeah. looking you at need GM. a me- you need a mesh you you need that no matter what um but it is it is really fascinating to look at the attrition because those are the reasons the patriots are yeah Ex- yeah coaching staff yep. retirement of coaches the shrinking of the coaching staff which is very small um players retiring like you know you are you and hightower and chung but the defense isn't the problem anyway but but the be that as it may no the but it, it, it does it, it has an impact on because i think one of the hard things about being on a team that we've never had to experience or it's been a little one way or the another or the other is having leaders that don't allow the team to turn into man if our offense would just play better we'd be better man if our defense would just play better we'd be better because i was there in new england on both sides of that in right. 2011 when we're winning games because we're averaging 35 points a game. And the only thing saving us on defense is we were at the top of the league in turnovers, but teams are marching up and down the field on us. And then I've been on teams like the 2018 team down the stretch where, you know, we're winning on defense. We're playing good ball in 2019. We're playing good ball on defense and the offense is trying to catch up. But I was saying both those situations, the top guys on offense and the top guys on defense were so well-respected that it was like, man, like, I'm not worried about y'all. Like, I know when it Mm -hmm. comes down to it, you're going to make the plays and we're going to win these games. And fortunate for us in both those seasons, you know, 18, obviously we win the Super Bowl, 19, we don't, but we still won games in those seasons. So you don't get as much of a fracture. I think the hard thing now is you're not winning games now. For two years in a row, your defense has played well, scoring touchdowns last season in 22 on defense and special teams. And then this year, I mean, holding people to six points, 10 points, like 
unbelievable games unbelievable. where you're, you're like you're holding teams. They're not scoring, and even you're not teams winning. That, and even the crappy teams that they people are like, well, what it was? It was the Commanders. The Commanders were scoring like twenty five points a game. The Colts were scoring yep. like twenty five points a game. They um, want to shut everybody down. So, and I think that's where you need you need strong leadership. And I think they need to start. You got to do a better job drafting so that leadership comes from the guys who have now watched the other guys perform. They've heard the Tom Brady stories. They've heard the Logan Mankin stories. Like. Those are the things that I think build your organization. Like when I went and I got a chance to interview Lamar Jackson and I'm in a Baltimore facility, like I never got to do that, right? I only played on one team. Yep. So I didn't see other facilities. And I'm walking through the Baltimore facility and I'm just seeing the Ray Lewis's. I'm seeing, you know, Ozzy Newsome. Like you're seeing all of these pictures on the walls of all of these Ravens greats. And I think when you walk in and you get drafted or you sign as an undrafted free agent, you instantly feel like if I play middle linebacker, I want to be the next Ray Lewis. Like I want to be, I don't want to be the next Brian Erlacher or Keekly. Like right mm-hmm. away, my alliance goes right to the, the greatest Ravens. And I think they, that's what needs to happen next for the Patriots. You have to start having those guys that come in and the Brendan schooler say, I want to be like Matt Slater. And then mm-hmm. that gets passed down from generation to generation and you, because you look at 2019 draft class, like I don't know if there's anybody there from the whole class. Like that, that's just crazy to think about. No one being there, and I think that makes it hard to try to win year in and year out. And it also makes it hard in that there's two facets to this. One is, well, why are they playing so hard on defense and not worrying about the offense? Who's sending the message from the front of the room? And I think that Gerard Mayo primarily, and then all the assistant coaches, Covington, Steve Belichick, Brian Belichick, Pellegrino. But I really think Gerard, knowing how he is, the fact that he has been at the front of that room, is a guy who's helped them from not having a fracture. You know Gerard better than I do, and I know him pretty good. So I would A, credit him largely for the performance of the defense, even though it's been a fruitless exercise for them to shut people down. And secondly, if you decide as the Patriots, look, we, we have to move on from Bill. We talked a lot about it. It's not been what we need it to be. We need a different culture change. We need uh, a different hand and eyes on offense. We want to change the GM. But we do want to maintain our link to the past. We do want to maintain our link to, it's not Ray Lewis, but our middle linebacker, Gerard Mayo, as opposed to bringing in, you know, Jonathan Gannon or whoever yeah. is, you know, Ben Johnson and having a, a new broom. You're not going to have that continuity because in Baltimore, there is the continuity because even though Ray Lewis came in and held 1995 or whatever, he played through Harbaugh. So he's still the head coach. So there is that link. There is a link you're going to lose with Bill. If, and when he goes, that goes to what you're talking about, where it's a program, it's a tradition, there's a college feel to it as opposed to a pro feel. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, even like you, because we brought up Baltimore, like even DaCosta was under Ozzie Newsom. Yes. It's like you, you just have all of this, you know, it just, it kind of stays, like we said, ingrained where now it's like, Hey, the names might change, but this relationship that we're building, it continues to stay the same. So, and I think no matter what, if they do move on from Bill and Gerard does take over, I think Mayo, his first priority has to be what we've been talking about. How do you develop the offense? Like, what do you do next? What is your staff going to look like? Do you keep everybody and continue kind of what's been done? Because I think that's a decision that has to be made. Like, how do we change to move forward to the future? Do we change one person? Do we change everybody? Like, how exactly do you move forward and, and have the ability to be, you know, a playoff team sooner rather than later? Like, those things, like once you you get to the bottom bottom of the league, where you know you're in the bottom five, it's not always easy to just say, "Well, if we do this, 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 and that, we're going to be in the playoffs next year." Like that's hard to do, even though the playoffs change every year. We always look at that, like the Giants. They did it for a year, and then next thing you know, they're opening it opening night Sunday night. We got them Sunday night football. Giants Dallas, like they went wow, well, <laughs> like. They got killed, and then they're like, "Are we not that good?" 
Like, and, and I think that's the hard thing that they have to figure out. No matter who they decide to be the head coach, it, it has to it has to really move forward in this big decision at quarterback on offense. Like, it, it's very rare. You got to have a plan. You like can't a- win the way the 2000 Ravens won in this league anymore. You just won't win with your offense doing bare minimum and your defense having to go and be this super dominant force week in and week out. Because you're going to play teams like the Baltimore Ravens with Lamar Jackson, where on any given day, he can score three rushing touchdowns. He can throw five passing touchdowns. He's going to be a game changer out there. And it's hard to say, like, when we get in the biggest game of the year as a defense, we're going to hold Lamar Jackson-led offense to 10 points. That's really hard to do. He, God, you had to deal with him. I'll never forget that game in 2019 when you guys were 8-0. And he went down there, and he was just they their their running game was terrifying. I the first time we played him, yep, yeah. You can't win. This team can't win like the 2018 team won either. I mean, you don't have all year to lose to five. I mean, that year was such a weird one. You guys lost to five non playoff teams in the regular season, and two of them in December. And then you, you can't expect any team to reconfigure its offense because it has a 20 year veteran, a quarterback. It's got the greatest tight end of all time. It's got one of the greatest slot receivers of the 21st century. It's got a running game led by some unbelievable interior linemen. That's impossible to duplicate. That takes years to build, to be amorphous on offense. We can to just, be oh, we're not going to be yep. that this week. Let's be this and, and we'll still yep. kick ass. And plus we have a defense. I, I do need to ask you this. Is it too early for Gerard Mayo to become a head coach? I don't think so. I, I think I think his time's coming, whether that's in New England. Um, I think this year could be that year because we don't know. I think every year, you know, now that I'm I'm in the media, you see it more where at one point it's like, man, there might be 10 head coaching vacancies available. Like, so you never know. But if it is, you know five or more like I think he has a chance to be a head coach this year somewhere else Uh, and I think that's what makes the decision even harder for the crafts that if they do really like Mayo and want him to stay in the building and be a part of the Patriots organization you know he turned down interviews last year he's been interviewed before like how many years is it going to go on until he says you know what like I'm ready like I want to get out there because That's the thing in coaching. Like, it might not always work the first time you become a head coach. So the sooner you can get out there and learn on the job and try to bring people around you to help you learn, the better you are. Because then if you get another shot at it and you get to do it again, you've already been through it and you've learned. Whereas you see some of these older coaches get the opportunity and then that's it. You know, and I think for him, he would probably rather say, I would love to get this opportunity as soon as possible and then I'll continue to learn and get better. I think, I think you know, obviously with Brian Flores and with Flo, the lawsuit might change that. But I think it's safe to say, like, what he learned in Miami, even and he had two winning seasons. But I think it's not like he was a total failure in Miami. But I think even moving forward, if he gets another opportunity, well, he's going to be better. And I think sure. now he's been in Minnesota, so he's been in a whole nother offensive plan that he didn't he didn't know the first time he went to Miami like everyone bashes him on his relationship with Tua and how it all he never was a part of anything other than what he saw in New England he tried to recreate that offense but now being with O'Connell and I know everybody's like well he started in New England yeah but O'Connell played one year in New England I don't even know if it was a full year in New England and then he was under McVay and he learned that stuff so I think Flo is now learning that he talked about being in Pittsburgh and learning college stuff from Pat Narduzzi, the the head coach of the the Panthers. So like he's now had all of these things. And I think for Gerard, I think it's the same thing. He can, he's a leader of men. So no matter where he's at, what role he has, you just hit on it. He's been a, probably a huge part of that defense continuing to show up week in and week out because he knows how to lead men. So I think no matter when he gets opportunity, he would be ready. He would crush it. And I think he, he's going to need the learning curve and, the learning experiences from everything. Like he's never, he's never had to do a salary cap, right? Draft, like all of those things will be new to him. But I think the thing that he has is he doesn't have an ego. He knows he needs to surround himself 
with people that are better at that stuff than he is so he can learn and give himself the opportunity to go out there and compete and be a good football team yeah. no matter and where he's at. It's it's that network of people around him that is so vital. All right, Jerome, yes. we, you're a leader of men. You're the voice we want at the front of the room. You're defensively outstanding. You understand how offenses work, but we're going to have Billy O'Brien run the offense, okay? He's got continuity there. And we're going to really concentrate on offense because we have a lot of players here on defense. Additionally, though, Gerard, we have expiring contracts for Hunter Henry, Mike Wenu, Kyle Duggar, Kendrick Bourne. It is a hard position to be in for yeah. whoever takes this team over because it's an expansion level team in terms of talent on offense. We've got a quarterback situation that we have to solve. If it comes to pass that Bill is relieved of duties as a parting of the ways and Gerard ascends, the network around him has to be outstanding. But one thing that I think is interesting, Dev, is not only does the network have to be outstanding, the petty grievances and the cloak and dagger and the behind the scenes stuff that sometimes goes on here, where guys are trying to pee on their territory or, and Bill does foster it a little bit, I think, with the way he runs the organization. You know, people think nobody talks ever. We, they do, but they're just terrified that anybody finds out if they talk. So there is kind of a real culture change that probably will ensue too. Yeah. And I, I think one of the hardest things that I compare this to even like watching super, super talented basketball players go play with LeBron James. Like they sometimes go into a show because it's like that aura around them. And I think with Bill in New England, like people come there and they instantly come with like this fear of coach Belichick. Like, I can't leave the building until it's a certain time because he'll look at me funny or I can't. And I think like from my time there, of how I look at when I came in as a rookie and was a young player, I remember I sat with Aeneas Williams and Aeneas was like, how often do you talk to, to Bill? And I was like, never. <laughs> I was like, I try to avoid him. Like it's a scary person. And he was like, that makes no sense. He said, you have the greatest head coach of all time that you get to work with every day and you don't think that talking to him is going to improve you as a player, as a person. And I remember he said that to me and I was still young. So at the time I was like, no, I'm still not doing it. But as I got older, I realized that like, why, why should I move in fear when I've now been with this guy? He knows me. I know him. If I have a question, if I need to talk to him about something, like I need to just go in there and do it and see what happens. And I don't think everyone has that mentality and not just players, I think around the whole building of like, at some point he has to just be Bill. Like mm -hmm. for you to work and do your job at a high level, he has to just be Bill. It can't be like, oh my God, Bill Belichick. Like you have to go and do what you think is best. Sometimes that can mean challenging him. Sometimes that can mean just like, all right, he, he's right on this. Like I need to, but like, to me, that's what good teams have, right? Like when Dak Prescott and Diggs got into it, um, in the preseason, and I think LaShawn McCoy was like, nah, you don't disrespect your quarterback like that. I was like, hey, they must have never came to training camp with us with Brady. Like, we <laughs> had the best quarterback of all time playing for us, and there was plenty of times we're yelling and screaming at each other, going at each other, cursing each other out, because that's what it takes. That's how you get better. Differences of opinions, all of that stuff has to find out how you get blended. How do you, how do you resolve conflict? How do you do those things? How do you say – Bill, this is the guy we need to draft. He's the guy. I don't care what you say. I'm standing on the table until, like, you have to be willing to almost get fired and be like, all right, I, I, like, let's do it. <laughs> but I think, like, you need that kind of energy around you. You need people in positions. If you're in a leadership position, you need to lead. And that's going to be different all throughout the building. But the team doctor needs to be a leader in his field. The head trainer needs to be a leader, the strength and conditioning coach, the sports science guy, like he need, like the nutritionist, like Ted Hart, like they all need to be leaders in their field and they have to be fearless in their leadership. They have to be willing to go and say what they need. It's not all going to get, you know, it's not going to all be yes, yes, yep, yep, whatever you need, but you have to have that to be good. You need to be able to challenge people. And I think that's why I love Gerard so much because like that's who he is naturally, whether when he was in New England, whether he left and went to Optum, whether he did some other business stuff on the side and, and uh, private equity, like he's a person that will just go. He's fearless. He likes taking on new challenges. 
Uh, and I think he brought that element to the team and primarily on defense. And I think that's why everyone was like, man, what are they going to do? They're losing Devin McCourty to leadership. They lost Hightower already. And it was like, no, they, they have good leadership. It starts with their coach and then it trickles down. Like now Steve Belichick's been there for a while. Mm -hmm. He's trusted in what how he calls a game. He's trusted in what he does. Those players respect and listen to him. So then you look up and it's like, okay, well, they lose Matt Judon. They lose this stud, this stud rookie, Christian Gonzalez. Don't worry. They're still top five. Like that's crazy to think about, but it, it also goes to show what leadership looks like. And I think on the offensive side, it's been different because even when you had Josh McDaniels, you always were missing the the offensive leaders. Once Edelman left and then James White left, like it, it made it a lot harder. You have Dave Andrews, but Dave's more of a quiet guy. He kind of leads on his yep. own by example. They haven't had, I think one of the biggest voices they missed, he was never a captain or anything, but is Jules. Like Jules, what, as Bill was saying, you need some a-holes. And Jules is that. Jules, if Bill says something in the, in the middle of the team meeting room, Jules is going to say something funny to Bill. Jules is going to challenge you, whoever the OC is. Like, that's who he is. He's going to challenge the day if the day's not going right. And I think they lost that. And I think they they tried to automatically put Mac. And I, that was my biggest thing when I was there. I was like, you can't put Mac in that position yet. He's still trying to figure out how to be a consistent, good player in the right. NFL. We can't ask him to be responsible for leading veteran players. We need them to help him more than he can help them right now and let him grow into that. But because there was no other strong leadership to me on offense, especially if skill wise, it kind of forced Mac into that role. And I think that's, what's been really tough for that offensive side to consistently show up and play a certain brand of football, even if you don't mm. win, but to have a, a kind of way about you, no matter what the game is, what day you show up and play that way, no matter what. It's fascinating, too, when you think back, okay, so what happened last year in August? Bill was kind of emboldening Mac, saying, look, he was he was outstanding as a rookie. He's even better now. He's made a dramatic jump. Um, there's everything we like about him. Really kind of saying these things publicly in a way that he generally – And he was, too. Player. I don't think people – I think sometimes people think like he was saying that to hype. Like, I was in the building. Like, the guy's always there. He, You saw how his body changed. He was working out like – he he does all of those things. So I don't think that was like hype. Cause I think some people think like, well, he was just hyping Mac up and all. No, like they really believe that. Like Mac's one of the hardest working young guys I've been around. When when then he pushes back the way. See, it's interesting. So you embolden the kid, you pump him up, he's a good player. And then when he starts to lose his shit as the season goes along and finally says something towards the defense to Matty P or he's trying really hard. And he apparently, and I never heard this directly, it's secondhand made calls to coaches and said, how can we do a better job here? I'm really struggling. The coach is back in Alabama. Then he was looked at as disloyal. So when there came pushback, Mac wasn't allowed to give it because he wasn't old enough in the league. He wasn't experienced enough. It was a showing up. Your take on that. Is that accurate? Somewhat, somehow? Well, 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 I always think from the simplest form, everything's about relationships. Like, I think no matter what, like if, if you and your wife are going through something and you seek counsel outside of y'all, she's going to kind of look at you like, like, why, like, yes. what's up? We can't like come to me if you have an issue. And I think that's ultimately what it always has to be. I think player to coach, any of that stuff, like if I have an issue, I need to go to you. I need to talk to you. And if I'm if you're having if I'm if I'm on a team and I'm having an issue with Gerard Mayo and Steve Belichick as my coordinators and it's not working out, then I need to now go to Bill. Like I don't need to go to somebody else and like I need to go to Bill. So I think I think that fracture happened a little bit because of the relationship. And I'm not exactly sure. Like I know I'm talking about, I don't know exactly what happened yep. with all of that. I've never talked to Mac about it. So but I think I always look at things from a relation, relational standpoint because Slater taught me that. Like, you can't lead without having relationships with people. Like, you need to know their why, their purpose, what they're about, what they want to play for. And I think no matter what, when you're in something with somebody, I need to I need to be able to connect with you. I need to be able to talk to you. I don't ever want to get a call from somebody not in the building saying, hey, so-and-so feels this way. 
about this and you need to like it's no different right now if I called Bill and was like, hey, man, I was talking to Gerard and Steve and they said he would be like, right, yeah, man, like, I respect you. You you helped us a lot, but I don't give a, what you're talking about. Like you're not here. And I think like that's a huge part of whatever transpired between them. If it if it happens outside of that circle, then I think it makes it hard. And, and you know, d- defending the other person, if you feel like you can't talk in the circle, then that makes it impossible for the relationship to grow. So you were kind of doomed no matter what, if you went outside or you didn't go outside, because if you felt like, hey, I'm talking, but nobody's listening or hearing me, then it it, it really doesn't matter. This wasn't going to work anyway. So I'm not exactly sure. I know I've had conversations with Mac and um, I believe he's had conversations with different people in the building, but I just don't know, like once you get in season, the extent of, going forward and and the different grievances you might have week in and week out. I don't know how any of that happened because once the season started, you know, we're all so focusing on our side of the ball and what we need to do. Yeah. We're helping each other, but the day in and day out little, you know, kind of minutia stuff that happens. Like I I wasn't a part of that. So Patriots close the season with the jets. They're going to do it at at Gillette stadium. They'll be home. They're going to win too. So a lot of people will be angry. Do you think that players are aware and give any consideration at all to draft position? I actually know the answer is absolutely not. Yeah, absolutely not. You want a job next year. You you don't you're not about to go out there and play bad. No, it's just, draft. Yeah. like you know what I mean. I hope but we it, pick fourth but instead people, of sixth. Who cares? People believe that though. Like people are like I um I'm watching the game and I'm like, Baltimore, the Denver game. Baltimore's a beast. Like I'm yeah. watching the game. And I'm like, he's taking over this game and I'm getting so many mentions. Yeah, but they're about to win. That's the dumbest thing they can do. How dumb are these guys? And I'm like, obviously you've only played fantasy football or whatever you want to talk or Madden that you think it's fun to go out there and let somebody knock you around and, and throw you all over the field. Like nobody signs up to be that guy. When you uh, look at the Patriots though, it's going to be interesting. Say you got Jake Andrews, who's a rookie offensive lineman. You got David Andrews, who's in his 30s and established guy. What if Robert Kraft would have come down and say, Bill, can we do that thing that you do where you develop some of the younger guys sometimes? I, I like how you do that. Can we turn this into a preseason game, you mean? <laughs> right. Yeah, if we, if, we, if we had the number one seed, let's turn it into – Baltimore Ravens, I'm calling the game on Westwood One Saturday. Yeah. Baltimore at some point will turn that game into a preseason game. Cool and dandy. If if I'm on a team and if I'm David Andrews and my head coach takes me out of the game and says, you're not playing this week, I would lose all respect for that person. And that's why like people can hate Bill all they want. He has the utmost respect for what those guys do day in and day out. He will not he will not go into this game without watching every bit of film, studying everything that has happened and transpired between the Jets and the Patriots in the last 10 years. Like he will do all of that because he feels like he owes that to these guys that give him so much. And not to mention, it's possibly going to be one of the greatest Patriots of all times last game in Gillette Stadium and Matthew Slater. You best believe like that team, that staff, everybody in that organization, I mean, as important as a draft is to the whole page organization, I would even tell you, I would bet Jonathan and Robert Kraft want to see Matt Slater go out the right way because they know what he's meant to that organization, how he stood in front of reporters, teammates, coaches, whoever it is, and he's always delivered and been consistent with his message. Like, there's no doubt in my mind, everybody associated with the Patriots wants to see – this guy probably bawling his eyes out on the field at the end of the game and joy because he's happy that it ended in a win, even though the season didn't go that way. But they know his faith and how he sees things, how awesome it would be walking off the field the last time in a Patriots uniform with a W and it be in the Jets. Like it's never fun losing to the Jets. Yeah, it's this, yeah, it's <laughs> gonna be a win. It's gonna be a win. You sound like you're ready to run through a wall for this one already. I mean, this... I'm, I'm, I'm crushed. I can't be there. I, I really, I really wish I could go to the game. Like I said to you, it's like Slate's meant a lot to me in my career and, and what he's done for, you know, not just me, but me and my wife, him and his wife, like 
we spent we spent a lot of time together and I just think the world of them. So if they told me like, hey, you could sign a one day contract and run down side by side with Slate on the kickoff, you down, I would be, for one, I would beat them down the field. I still I can still run. Um, and I, I would I would do it in a heartbeat. Um, but new responsibilities, new jobs. Uh, I won't be able to be there, but um, I'll be we'll have all the games on and I'll be locked into every special teams rep. Um, that he's out there doing because I know he's going to want to play well um, if this is his last game. All right. Well, you're the best. Thank you. Your season so far has been unbelievable. I really have enjoyed you. I mean, you just – it's great because you just don't care when the when the light goes on. You're just going to well, talk – I mean, you're very well prepared, obviously. And, you know, but it's like you're just going to be dev. And that is – I, I love walking in our building on Sundays and I see you and Phil usually on one <laughs> of our screens on – our, one of our NBC affiliates is you and Bill, you and Phil usually holding it down. Every once in a while, I send you the picture. You guys yeah. up there talking nonsense. These <laughs> clowns just send the picture. <laughs> All right, Dev. Hey, thanks for your time, buddy. 